Welcome online family to the Hill Ministries, wherever you're watching it. We thank you so much for tuning in and it's going to be an amazing video we have here today. It is going to be a great day whether you're watching it live or you're watching it after the fact. We just want to welcome you to service today. God bless you. We got some special messages for you afterwards, so we'll see you then. Let's pray over the message. Father in heaven, you know my heart and you know the hearts of each and every person in this place. You know our thoughts, you know where our minds are right now. But Lord Jesus, I would ask that you'd anoint me to speak what you would have me to speak. Lord Jesus, you'd open the hearts and minds, open the ears of people to receive what you would have for them today. I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We've been in the book of uh, Exodus. We're looking at the Ten Commandments, and, and if you have your Bibles and want to turn there, Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6 is what I'm going to cover today. I'm not going to cover it extensively, but I'm going to give you an overview of that, and then we're going to go right into the message that I hope you will pay attention to and that you'll receive something from today. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me, God. You shall have no other gods before God. You shall not make for yourself a carved image of any kind, of any likeness, of anything that is in the heavens above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the fourth, third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. The commandments of the Lord are great, and the very first one is you shall love the Lord your God and you shall worship and serve Him only, and that's an important, important commandment. And the biggest thing about that is if you don't know who God is, who are you worshiping? You have to have an understanding, you have to have a knowledge of God that, that, that transforms your life. A.W. Tozer said this in his book, The Knowledge of Holy, and I want to thank you. I've, I've received two copies of that book this week, and when I find my third one, I may sell the other two. I don't know. We'll just see. We'll put them in the library. I'll give them away. I'm joking. The Knowledge of the Holy. But he says this, the very first chapter, the very first lines of his chapter are this. What comes to your mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Today, if I asked you that question, what comes to your mind when you think about God? Would you give me the, 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 would you give me the God of the Bible? Would you give me the true God of the Bible that we find from Genesis to Revelation? Would you give me the Bible that has, uh, would you give me the God that has inspired you to serve him and to worship him? Or would you give me that culturally accepted God that, that you and the people around you find acceptable? That's my question for you today. One of the biggest problems we have in our world today is who is God? And we have a lot of people that want to be God and put themselves in the position of God. But the question that you need to answer, the church needs to answer today is, who is God? In the past few weeks, we've seen people murdered. We've seen people killed and murdered. We've seen unspeakable things done to women and children, kidnapping and, and people held hostage. And all the while, these people that are doing these uh, atrocities in our world, they're crying out. They're saying, God is great. In reality, they're, they're saying, if you take the correct interpretation, of our God is greater. Let me tell you, they are not worshiping the God of the Bible. Who is their God? Their God is a demonic spiritual force that has influenced them for evil and darkness. Where they worship death rather than life. Tracy, you're getting on it real early again. Keep going. Here we go. I know I, can, I got an amen section in, in some areas. But I got to tell you, what's going on in our world is craziness. is insanity. I, 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 sometimes, you know, you get this 
you get this feeling sometimes you just want to pick people up and slap them upside the head and say, wake up. What are you thinking? Who are you serving? Who is your God? We have some who would say they're God. We have some who would say there is no God. But willingly serve the God of their own making. Through demonic and spiritual forces, they serve a God that's pleasing to themselves. This, this, these spiritual forces that come in and, and influence you, they're influencing you to listen to a counterfeit knowledge, a counterfeit in, in, intellect that's not based on truth, but is based on lies. See, we have two places we can get our information. We have two places that have great influence on us. Keith Richards says this, and I'm not telling you to listen to everything Keith Richards says, okay? But he said this, he said, when, you, when you're growing up, there are two institutional places that affect you the most powerfully. The church, which belongs to God, and the public library, which belongs to you. Wow. Oh. You can be influenced by God, or you can be influenced by what you want to influence you that we put in our libraries today. Boy, what wisdom came out of his mouth there. <laughs> wow. See, the biggest divide in the church today is over who God is, what he is, the work, he's do he, the work he does, the grace he offers, and, and, and his will for mankind and for the church. The biggest divide between all the churches, these are things that divide us. Who is God? What, what work is he doing? What work is he going to do? What, what's his grace truly mean? And, and, and the offering of his grace, what does it cover? And how does it cover? And his will for mankind, what is God's will for mankind? Some religions will interpret it one way, others another way. And what is his will for the church of Jesus Christ? We must understand who God is to even understand the first commandment that he gives. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You'll serve him only. And you say, well, who is God? I have 92, 92 things in the Bible that define God to me. He's Jehovah. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's, uh, he's uh, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He's Je Jehovah Jireh. He's the, the Lord shall provide. He's Je Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. He's, he's Jehovah Nisa, the Lord who is my banner. He's, uh, he's Je Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace. You guys want me to keep going? <laughs> we I can go 92. I've got 92 of them. The everlasting Father. He's the Almighty. He's the I Am. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. He's our sacrifice. He's our ransom. He's the Lord who heals you. He, he's, he's the heir of all things. He's the temple. He's a sanctuary. He's, a, he's our intercessor. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's our advocate. He's He's better than, than the old covenant. He is the covenant, period. He's the resurrection and the life. I'm skipping. He's the word. John chapter 1, verse 1. He's the alpha and the mega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the light of the world. He's the lamb of God. He's the creator of all things. He's master. He's mediator. He's the bread of life. He's the high priest. He's the rock. He's the rock upon which we're broken. He's the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's the rock in my fortress. He's the rock of my refuge. He's the rock that is higher than everything else and all else. He's the rock of my salvation. He's the rock of my, and my redeemer. He's the builder. He's the stone cut without hands. He's the faithful. He's the strong tower. He's our foundation. He's preeminent. He's the tree of life. He's the bright morning star. 
He's the son of righteousness. He's our gift. He's the head. He's the head of the body, the church. A life-giving spirit. He's the head of all principalities and power. And I could go on. A.W. Tozer, you're going to say, I've been reading a lot of him, so I'm going to quote a lot of him. He says this, if we take away any of the attributes of God, we do not weaken God, but we weaken our concept of God. Today, we live in a world, we live in a spiritual realm uh, where the Spirit wants us to weaken the concept of God in our hearts and our minds and our lives. And if he can weaken the concept of God in your life, he can weaken God and his power in your life. Am I telling you today that God is a genie that we can call, call out of a bottle and, and, and his voice sounds like Robin Williams? No, not at all. I'm telling you that God is overall, above all. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our th- ways. His knowledge is all-knowing. I got a problem with that. I'm still trying to figure that one out. He knows everything. But he's God. And if he didn't, he wouldn't be God. And if he wasn't these things, he wouldn't be God. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter 5, as I attempt to bring to you a higher knowledge of God that is needed in our world today, in our lives today, if we hope to see him. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says this, King Belshazzar made a great feast for his thousands of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousands. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and the silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, he brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine. This is important. Underline this. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's important that you recognize that everybody has a God and you need to acknowledge what God you worship. What God are you serving? Remember in the opening of the book of Esther, this is kind of the same scene we see taking place there. In the book of Esther, they open up with what? A big party, uh, uh, a king drinking before his, uh, his uh, uh, lords and his leaders, and ultimately he calls the queen in and she won't come. And, and, and because of that event, Esther ends up becoming the queen. It says in front of, that means you're leading. So you have to watch what I do and what I say and how I am because I'm in front of people. Some people that are in front of you, they're not worried about what they say, what they do, their appearance or anything like that. Because why? They want to lead you astray. This king is in front of all of them, and he's saying, this is what we do. This is what we do. Today we have all kinds of people in front of us telling us, this is how you do it. This is how you live. This is, this is what's important in life. And, we, and, we, and it's amazing that uh, maybe not us old people, because maybe we've surpassed that time in our life, but uh, at a younger day, I, I've looked at some of your pictures uh, some of the hairstyles, some of the things you did, you were influenced. <clears throat> Kids today are still being influenced. They're, they're being influenced. And, and I got to tell you, it, it's, it's easy to be influenced. But pay, 
Watch out who's influencing you. Watch out who is an influencer in your life. We have this new thing called influencers. I haven't figured that out yet quite. But I've got to tell you this. I'm going to watch who influences me. I don't listen to a lot of people that the world listens to. Matter of fact, I listen to people I wouldn't even recommend you listen to sometimes to get information only. But we've got to watch who influences us. And the king is standing before him and saying, hey, we're going to have a drunken orgy right now, right here, right now. It's going to happen. And I'll lead you out on it. We're going to worship all our gods, all the gods that we, we, we've imagined in our heart, we've imagined in our mind, and we're going to worship those. We're going to worship those gods. We're going to bring the vessels of, of those people that we took into slavery, into exile, many years. We're going to take their vessels that they used in worship of their God, and we're going to use them to worship our God, to belittle their gods. We're going to destroy, we're going to destroy the power of their God by worshiping our gods with their instruments. We're going we're gonna to destroy the church of Jesus Christ by bringing the world's gods into the church and worshiping those gods. Boy, this is where we find ourselves at the same place in history, it seems like. Are we guilty of this? I know our world is. See, we, we have a thing called pride, and, and, and we have a month of pride. We have, we have things that are going on. We, we're promoting we're promoting a sin. We're promoting a God that is influencing our world. And we're saying the whole world has to be tolerant of this and has to accept it. I tell you, you don't have to. You don't have to accept it. Pastor tells a story in a book that I was reading recently. Tells a story of him traveling to a conference in India. He got to the conference in India, got to the got to the airport, and, and uh, 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 he went to this first service, and boy, the powerful, powerful worship, and, and the events were taking place, and, and he came to this conclusion, worship, the worship of God transcends culture. And I'm here to tell you, the worship of God does transcend culture. No matter where you're at in the world, there are people worshiping God, the creator of the universe, the God of the Bible. There are people observing the Ten Commandments, and that, that today in our world have, have become something we lock up in a closet or take off our public grounds. He says the worship of God trans, transcends cultures. He then had to travel to a, a small Bible training uh, 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 place that they, that they train teachers and preachers of the gospel. And as he was traveling through, he's seen, he seen along the road because they traveled to some small little village where there was a thatch roof hut, hut, hut sitting there. And uh, as he's traveling along, he sees these little tiny monuments along the road. He's seen people worshiping at those, the, the Hinduism and the worship of demon gods all along the roadside. On the beaches, he's seen the same thing. People gathered around to, to worship uh, uh, these demon gods. And he arrived at the small thatched roofed hut where Bible training was happening and, and uh, they opened up for questions. The, the people asked questions and he answered them through the translator. But during the break, he spoke with one of the pastors and his wife who spoke English. And as he was speaking with him, he asked, had you ever been to America? And they, they said, they answered, yes, we've, we've been to America once. And he then asked, do you ever plan to return? And, and he noticed the wife had this really odd, uh, disgusted look on her face when he said that. And he pushed her. And he said, what, what, what's that with that expression? you, you got to tell me why you took that sour expression when I mentioned America and coming back to America. His wife, got, his wife kindly said, told him, she would never return to America because of all the idolatry she witnessed in America. Oh, you're kidding me. I just, I, just, I just came here. I just traveled this road, and, and, and uh, every mile I seen another uh, monument to some demon god, and, and I seen people worshiping and bowing and, 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 and praying and, and doing things for these gods. And, and you say, America is full of 
idolatry. So she explained, stadiums remind me of the great temples where they worshipped athletes and musicians as gods. Restaurants reminded her of Paul's words that make, uh, that, uh, to not make your stomach your God. Large shopping malls reminded her of Jesus' words not to worship money or worry about what, you wear, what we wear. Strip clubs reminded her of the pagan temples in the ancient cities called Corinth where sex, where sex was part of worship. See, we often have too narrow of understanding of worship and we do not see the idolatry. In, it empowers our sins. Worship is love in action. Worship is making sacrifice so that we can outpour our resources, our time, our money, our emotion, our energy to someone or something that we prioritize above all else. The question is not whether or not someone worships, but instead who or what they worship and how they worship. Well, King Belshazzar, his lords, his wives, his concubines are partying, drinking, and doing their thing. In worship of imaginary gods, this is what happens. Verse 5 and 6. Immediately the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall on the king's palace opposite the lamp stand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. When God enters the picture, there's always a reaction and a response. When God enters your picture in your life, there should always be a reaction and response. God's, God enters the Garden of Eden after sin, and what's the action and response of, of Adam, he runs and hides. Some of you, you've got the Adam response when God comes in. When God comes into your life, when the Holy Spirit comes in, convicts you and speaks to your heart and to your mind, what do you do? You run and hide. You, may be, you, you can hide behind excuses. You can hide behind other people. You can compare yourself to other people. You can hide all these different ways but ultimately, when God shows up, there is a response and a reaction. I can look at Abraham. When Abraham was, was uh, uh, spoken to by God, he had a choice of response and reaction. What did he do? He obeyed God. When, when I, look at, I look at Moses. When Moses encountered God, he got down on his knees. He took his shoes off. He, he worshiped. He, he gave homage to God. He didn't want to do what God told him he needed to do, but he did it. And ultimately, his response to the voice of God was relational. I'm going to keep listening to this guy. We stopped listening. Moses kept listening to God. Moses kept listening to such a point that he was considered a friend of God. He talked to him face to face. Not literally face to face, but he was like a friend that could talk to him face to face. Wow, the power. How about, how about Paul? When Paul was Saul and struck off of his uh, donkey and, and on the ground, he had, a, he had a chance to respond. I've been killing Christians and now I have a chance to birth Christians. You look at John. John on the Isle of Patmos, when he encounters God, there's a response, and there's so many more throughout the Bible. Here's the response of King Belshazzar. Here's the Hebrew translation. I love your Bibles. I think they're great, but sometimes we need to go back and look at the Hebrew and decide exactly what it means. But listen to the Hebrew translation here. It says, <clears throat> his countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened. Now, we're all adults here. Use your imagination. Some of you got it right away. I'll, I'll read it again for some of you that didn't get it. The joints of his hips were loosened. Has anything ever scared the 
out of you? Okay, some of you are finally it's starting to click. Okay, I can see some more smiles in the congregation. The king potentially, looking at the Hebrew, just soiled himself. In the king, verses seven through nine, I won't take the time to read them because of time. He, but, he, but he does this in, the, in verse seven. He says, he called loudly to bring in the enchanters. He says, he says give me the smartest Give me the wisest, give me the brightest people. Give me all those, those guys that can, they can tell the future and, and can give me wisdom and knowledge. Call all those guys in. He's yelling loudly, bring them in now. And I'm going to give them a change of clothes. I'm going to give them gold. I'm going I'm to do all these. They can be third ruler in the, in the country. But here, bring them in. Tell me what's going on here. See, the world... Its wisdom, its intelligence, its knowledge cannot answer the question of God. They tried. They came in. Not a one of them could give an answer to what this writing meant. Verses 10 through 31, though. Well, 10. We'll start with 10. I won't go too far, but it says, The queen, and this will be the queen mother. The, the, the queen mother isn't invited to the orgy. That's a good thing. But she hears about what's going on, and so what, what happens? She gets to come in because there's something about the queen mother that's over the queen. It's like my mom. She can get away with things that other women can't get away with. She can get in to talk to me and say stuff, speak stuff into my life when others may be barred from doing that. Queen Mother hears what's going on and she comes in and she declares, O King, live forever. Powerful statement there. Trying to get in good graces with uh, potentially her grandson. But she tells of a man that his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, used in situations like this. I love what she says in um, verse 11. She says, there is a man. When I, when I read that, there is a man, it makes me think of the woman at the well. It goes into town and says, there, there is a man. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods in the days of your father Light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of God's, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, and your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enhancers, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. It was Daniel. So you got to remember the timeline here. Because from verse from chapter four to chapter five is probably at, at least thirty years, perhaps more. You also have to remember the, in context that that uh, Daniel is now seventy. Some some believe he could be even in his late eighties at this point when he's called in before the king. He's been around. Some of you some of you think, oh, the life of Daniel was exciting. Look at all the. Marvelous things that took place in his life. No, it's in his lifetime. Another life experience. Are you ready for the next life experience that God gives you? Are you ready for the next time God uses you in a powerful way? Oh yes, he used Daniel numerous times, but that was over a lifetime. He wants to use you if you'll be ready over your lifetime. Chapter 5, let's skip to verse 13. Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to him, said to Daniel, listen to this, this is, this is powerful. You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, who the king my father brought from Judah. Hey, you're, you're one of those exiles. You're one of those, serv- you're one of those 
lowly guys that we captured. Look at me, high and mighty up here with soiled pants. I truly think he, he needed to put Daniel down before he could let him come in and speak to him because I'm the king. Pride gets in the way so many times, doesn't it? Daniel was in exile, and I believe this is a way of belittling him. So Daniel needs to set the record straight and lay the foundation for what's about to happen to the king. We'll skip down to verse 17 here in just a moment. Before reading the writing uh, on the wall, Daniel lays out the truth about God, the God that he serves, and his hand in all things that are happening Verse 17 says this, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for someone else. Because the king said, I, I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you uh, gold. I'm going to give you a purple garment. I'm going to give you new clothes, new jewelry. And you're going to be the third in the kingdom. Daniel's response, I got all the gold I want, all I need. I don't need your clothes. I don't need your, your position. I'm an old man. I've got everything I want, everything I need. God has provided it all. He says, let your gift be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will, I, I will read the writing of the king to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, this is the groundwork, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. This is the power of God that God gave his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. This is the honor I give God, then Daniel does. He says this, Daniel answered and said, Blessed are the names, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He's got to give honor to God because God is about to reveal something very powerful to him. Remember what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar? Some of you... Uh, probably remember, but verse uh, 20, let's go to verse 20. It kind of gives a recap of it. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit, this is Nebuchadnezzar, was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from, uh, from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed with grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God ruled the kingdoms of mankind and set over whom he will. If you want to see that, it's found in Daniel chapter 4, that very event. I love what it says in 29 through 32, but I just want to quote just a couple of things. They're not in your notes, but, but I, I added them this morning. Uh, he's walking on the walls. King Nebuchadnezzar is walking on the walls of, of, of this great city that he's built, and he says, <clears throat> Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? I love the next words. While those words were still coming from the king's mouth, there fell, it says, there fell. Now, if, if something falls, that means it's heavy, right? Things that are light don't fall. They just kind of float to the ground. But there's a heavy word that falls from heaven. And it said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you, it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. It goes on to say, until you, and, and, until you know that the most high rules, the kingdom of man, the kingdom of man and given to 
whom he will. God's going to decide who has it now. Verse 22 of chapter 5. And you, his son, you know this story. You, you've heard this story. You, you, you're, a, you're a witness to this story in some form or fashion. He says, you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. Underline that, though you knew all this. You might even want to put a little star out to the side and say, though you knew all this. I almost want to say it again, because some of you aren't tracking. We do things regularly that we know we shouldn't do. It's a verse my dad taught me years ago in James chapter 14, or James chapter 4, verse 17. It says in the ESV, it says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, to him it is sin. Of course, I learned in the King James, he, he who knoweth to do right and doeth not, to him it is sin. As a young man, I'll be honest, this scripture was one of those scriptures I always wanted to get around. I was almost like, don't teach me anymore. I don't want it to be sin to me. <laughs> kind of happy and content right here. But Daniel is pointing his finger, that old finger. Don't old guys bug you sometimes? Man, they bug you. They, see, they know a little bit more than you. They have a little more experience. And they point their bony finger at you and say, that is not right. And you know what? You know what? That makes you mad. I know because I pointed my bony finger at some of you and you've gotten mad. It's not right. It's not good. It's going to cause you trouble. It's going to cause you separation from the Spirit of God if you continue on this path. See, truth it's difficult to hide. And that's what Daniel's giving to the king, truth. Truth is difficult to hide, and history erased will always be relived. Truth, I, I need someone to look that up because I, I came up with it, and, and I didn't, didn't find it anywhere. If someone else said that, I don't want to take credit for it, but I want to take credit for it. <laughs> truth is difficult to hide, and history erased will always be relived. Verse 24. Then from his presence, then from his presence, the hand was set, sent, and this writing is inscribed, and this is the writing of, of the, ins ins this was the writing that was inscribed. Mini, mini, tekel, pasun. There's an interpretation of the matter. Mini, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Pierce, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Talk about taking the wind out of your sails. Talk about be a major wound. My kingdom's going to be taken. My days have been numbered. What does that mean? My days have been numbered. What does it mean that, that, that the Medes and the Persians, we, we live in this fortified city and they, there's no way they can get in. We, we've done everything to protect this city. They can't, they can't take us. They've been trying for years. They can't take us. We're okay. I'm okay. You 
You need to listen to what God has to say. You can build a life that you think is bulletproof. You can build a, 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 a family that you think is bulletproof. You can raise your children in a, in a home that you think is bulletproof. But ultimately, here's the thing. The Lord's going to speak, and as, are you going to listen to his voice? Or will you keep worshiping the gods of this world and bringing them into your home and into your life and into your relationships and ultimately destroying them? Because there's going to be a time when the hand of God comes and speaks into your life. And will it say something like this? Your days have been numbered. And, and here it is. It's over for you, dude. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness. But he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. We got a bunch of people in a, in a, in a crowded hall that's, that's worshiping the gods of this world, imaginary gods that have been created by them through demonic activity in them, and ultimately what we have is God's going to speak. He was patient. He's been patient. But when you take the vessels, the instruments of worship to me and give them to your gods, we got a problem. What happened when the Ark of the Covenant is, is stolen or taken or taken in battle and, and taken into the camps and into the temples of foreign gods? Terrible things happen. Today, if you're bringing things into your world, into your life, into your family, that are destructive and they become gods of worship in your household, get rid of them. Destroy them. Say, we don't have God. We have gods. What do you love the most? What are you allowing to affect your life the most? What are you, what are you, what are you rat holding money for the most? I, I had an incident happen this week. I, I, I had needed a part for something, and, and you know me, I, I got to get, I like, I like my vehicles and my stuff. And so, so I went out, I got older stuff, all my stuff's older, but I went out to get the part, and I pulled out, I pulled out cash. And this guy, wow, cash. Use it as much as you can, people, okay? Let's, let's, start, let's start this process, okay? I pulled out cash, and he, he said, wow, you got cash. I said, yeah, this is, this, is, this is rat hole money for these type of things that come up. Got to put it away, and then, then when something like this comes up, I have the cash to pay for it. Vicki, you know about it. Okay, don't, don't get all excited. <laughs> but here's the thing. These things could become gods in your life. These hidden gods that you, that you, that you carve out time. Someone told me this week they, they had to take one of the apps off their phone because they found themselves spending so much time watching stuff on this app. And it's like it was, it was, it was becoming controlling of their life. Let me tell you, get rid of it. If you'll give your time, effort, emotion, money to, it may be a God and you may need to get rid of it. Where am I at? I don't know. i got to get back to it. Here we go. 3, 10, 2 Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bottles, bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in, on it will be exposed. I'm sure Bill Chazer was sitting there thinking, my grandpa, he had 12 months from the time of his dream and the interpretation of his dream until he went crazy. He had 12 months Belshazzar, 
sorry to say you got probably 12 hours or less. But, but, but Grandpa, had, Grandpa had 12 months. Grandpa lived on for 12 months before he said those stupid things he said and, and dishonored the God, the creator, and, and the giver of all power. He had 12 months before that happened to him. Belshazzar, you have less than 12 hours. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being 62 years old. There's still hope for me. Closing. John Calvin said this If God does nothing random, there must always be something to learn. If God does nothing random, there must be there must always be something to learn. Today you were here, you may think, oh, I just wasted this time. No, you were here because there was something for you to learn. Yes. Amen. Amen? There was something for you to learn. Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 24, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not worship any other idols or any other gods. If you didn't get my points today, which I'm really bad about giving points, so I'll give you four right now. Number one, acknowledge your God or gods. Acknowledge it. Figure out who you worship and figure out if it's the right God or if it's just a bunch of gods. Number two, seek godly help in the destruction of your idols. Didn't get into a lot of that, but ultimately, Daniel had to be the godly help. Thank God for a queen mother that comes in and says, I know a man. Today, I come to you and say, I know a man. I know a spirit that can help you. Find that. Number three, stand firm on the truth of history. Stand firm on the truth of history. God's word is true, and it's truth. Stand firm on the truth of history. Number four, trust God to do everything he has said. Trust God to do everything he has said. A.W. Tozer. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion and that man's spiritual history will be positively demonstrated that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. What is your idea of God? Let's stand. Wow, that was an amazing video. Uh, thank you so much for watching it, and it's going to be amazing to look forward to what we have next week and just always coming up at the Hill, whether you're watching online or in person. Do you want to tell us a little bit about ways you can get connected and Absolutely, be involved Jace. here? Yeah, great. Like you already said, awesome, awesome service today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to really see you in person. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're able to join us in person, all the service schedules are online www.thehillministries.church. Check us out. You can find out about all the ministries, all the different days and nights and times. All kinds of great stuff, Jason, is going lot, on. A lot. Ministry for all ages. Mm -hmm. Get informed and get involved. We'd love to see you on a Sunday morning as well. Uh, also, if you'd like to give, go online, www.thehillministries.church forward slash give. You can also uh, give on the uh, app 
and uh, would love to have you be a part of our ministry, agree together uh, financially. We appreciate that support. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, if you just like to reach out and make contact with us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're unable to do it in person, then send us an email, office at thehillministries.church. We'd love to hear your prayer requests, your praise reports, or just hear from you and how you're doing and, and get connected with our community. So again, we pray that God will move in your life, that you've been blessed by today's uh, services and uh, the videos you've watched. So God bless you. We'd love to see you in the service soon. Yep, we love you, Hill family. We'll see you.